tuning into Sci-Fi TV, the viewer's guide to genre television for the weeks of July 25th to August 7th, 2015. Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin Batchelder. I'm Wendy Hembrock. And I'm Brent Barrett. All righty. Catch you up on a little bit of podcast news here before we cover a couple of weeks' worth of shows. We've got a new poll up on the website. We hope you come by and vote in, where we're asking you, what do you do when you're watching a show for a while and then you realize that you no longer enjoy it? Got four choices there for you, from stopping to keeping to the end to maybe letting the apps pile up. And actually, at this point, with a small lead, is with 36% of the vote, people say they just completely stop watching. And uh, the number two choice right now is that they let the apps pile up and wait to hear from others, just behind at 33%. Interesting. Yeah, it's sort of um, how how aggressive do you get? And whether I'm curious whether the size of your DVR is part of the factor of giving them up versus letting them linger. I wonder if this is really something um, specific to us genre fans, because if you ask a, a non-genre TV viewer, a casual TV viewer this question, they'd say, well, I just stopped watching it. What are you, what are you an idiot? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, you get the question down there for the completest too, Kevin. Uh, you know, the, you do that on some shows too. You want to really complete the show. And uh, 13% of those people are saying, "I even if I don't enjoy it anymore, I'm going to keep watching it because i got to complete it. Yeah. These are a lot of things mentioned by folks on that tuner minute that came up. So that's where this is interesting. I'd be curious to see the... You know, which ones as far as percentage of votes change. So please stop by the website, folks, and uh, let us know your thoughts on that one. Still early in the numbers. And the other item to mention, as you've been hearing recently, we had a contest giving away a $50 uh, Netflix gift card. And we selected the winner. Congrats to listener Tom from Minnesota for winning that one. Very nice, Tom. We hope we hear from you once you tell us what you've been liking on Netflix. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And we should have another contest coming pretty soon. All right, let's get ready to move over to our spoiler-free water cooler. You can find culture at the theater. You can find culture in the bottom of an unwashed coffee mug. Or you can find culture on your iPod. Join Brad, Glenn, and Christina on Pod Culture. Equal opportunity geekness. Go to www.podculture.net. All right, up first, as always, our quick reviews. And we have two weeks worth for you folks since we didn't record last weekend. So take a little while here. This is where we rate the shows with the quick items. Maybe you'll watch it now. I'll watch it soon. Let it sit on the DVR. Or the worst option, naturally, of all, that you can skip it. All right, going back to Saturday, July the 25th. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell, seventh and final episode of its first season, Chapter 7, entitled the same as the show, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell, but not a show I'm watching. This was really good. I would say watch it now. Um, Maybe I was distracted, but I'd only give it a high and watch it soon. Next, going to Sunday, the 26th, Beauty and the Beast, season three, episode number eight, Shotgun Wedding. Not one on my calendar, though. Uh, Let it sit. I did let it sit because I'm not watching right now. <laughs> all righty next would be falling skies season five episode five non-essential personnel uh not one i'm watching uh watch it sometime let it sit which is by the way the same thing as watch it sometime <laughs> but i give it a let it sit as well <laughs> it's, a, it's a one notch higher in the windy scale okay for me for me it's one notch higher it's a high end let it sit then folks if you're translating at home <laughs> 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 gonna fit her in the box all right also on sunday uh the 26th there we have humans this would be the fifth episode here of its first season uh just episode 1.5 uh i really enjoyed this one i'd give it a very high watch it soon i agree strong watch it soon hey kevin's on board high end watch it soon next to the last ship season two episode seven alone and unafraid i uh just to watch it soon on this one i strong watch it soon Oh, I'll go low and watch it now. It's great. And finally on Sunday, we have The Strain, season two, episode number three, Fort Defiance. Uh, not one on my schedule. I'm not watching this either. 
I give this one a high end watch it soon. All right, moving to Monday, the 27th of July, we have Teen Wolf, season five, episode number six, required reading. Not much of a fan. I'd say low watch it soon. Yeah, I would say low watch it soon also. I, I have a, the new watch it sometime, the high end let it sit rating for this one. <laughs> <laughs> and it confused me. All right, let's move to Tuesday, the 28th. We have Proof, season one, episode number seven, St. Luke's. Uh, not one in my calendar. I'm not watching this either. This one I'd only give a let it sit to. All right. The other Tuesday show, Scream, season one, episode number five, Exposed. Another that I'm not watching. Not watching this either. Also, I believe a let it sit. All right. Final Tuesday show of this week would be Stitchers, season one, episode number nine, Future Tense. Oh, it's, it's pretty solid. Probably middle of the road. Watch it soon. Not a show I watch. I'll go low and watch it soon. All right, Wednesday the 29th, Extant, Season 2, Episode number 5, The New Frontier. Uh, not one on my schedule. I'm not watching this closely enough to rate it. I go watch it soon. Friday the 31st of July. First up here will be Dark Matter, Season 1, Episode number 8. Just Episode 1.8. And uh, for Dark Matter, just um, average watch it soon. I go high watch it soon. Yeah, high watch it soon. Also Friday, we have Defiance, Season 3, Episode number 9, Ostinato in White. Uh, for this one, I would give it a middle to upper watch it soon. Oh, I think I'll go low watch it now. Yeah, great episode. Low watch it now. Hmm. All righty. Final Friday show, Killjoys, Season 1, Episode number 7, Kiss Kiss Bye Bye. Greatly enjoyed it. Very high watch it soon. Yeah, strong watch it soon. Wow. Okay, this is for you in the listening audience who uh, complain that uh, I constantly rate Killjoys less than Dark Matter. Um, I would give this Killjoys higher than both uh, Wendy and Kevin. I'd say low-end watch it now. Ooh, awesome. Make a note of the date. All right, moving to Sunday now of uh, August 2nd with the double week. Beauty and the Beast, Season 3, Episode number 9, Cats Out of the Bag. Not one I'm watching. Let it sit, unless you're really into weddings. <laughs> I'm not watching. I like that. A rating with a caveat. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Moving next to Falling Skies, Season 5, Episode number 6, Respite. Not one I'm watching. Oh, it was better. I'll say low watch it soon. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's slightly better than the week before. Low watch it soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to Humans, Season 1, Episode number 6, uh, simply Episode 1.6. Uh, this was a middle to upper watch it soon for me. Oh, this was a watch it now for me. Yeah, watch it now. All right, next is The Last Ship, season number two, episode number eight, Safe Zone. Uh, this one I greatly enjoyed. Very high, watch it soon. Yeah, I would go low, watch it now. Yeah, my second Last Ship, uh, this uh, podcast episode to rate, and the second time I've given it a low end, watch it now. All right, finally on Sunday is The Strain, season number two, episode four, The Silver Angel. Not one I watch. I'm not watching this either. Watch it soon. On to Monday, August the 3rd. Teen Wolf, Season 5, Episode 7, Strange Frequencies. Getting really disappointed with Teen Wolf. Dropping down to a middle to lower watch it soon. Yeah, low watch it soon. It's funny. Uh, I think this week got a little better than the week before, and uh, you said it was getting worse and you're going down to a watch it soon. I went up from a let it sit. I'm giving this one a watch it soon. <laughs> okay. All right, moving to Tuesday, August the 4th. First one here is Proof. 1.08, Reborn. Not one I'm watching, though. Nor am I. It's hit kind of a draggy patch. I'd say let it sit. All right, next on to Scream. Season 1, episode number 6, Betrayed. Uh, not one I'm watching. Not watching either. A little better than the previous week. Low end, watch it soon. All right, finally on Tuesday we have Stitchers. Season 1, episode number 10, Full Stop, which is the season finale. I really liked it. I'd give it a watch it now. Not a show I'm watching. I enjoyed it, but I could only give it a high end watch it soon. All right, moving to Wednesday, August the 5th, Extant 2.06. You say you want an evolution. Not one that I watch. Mm, I'm watching, but I'm not rating this show because I'm not watching it that closely. I recommend you go back and watch this episode more closely. Low end, watch it now. Ooh, finally, a reason to pay more attention. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, and moving to Friday, August the 7th, Dark Matter, first season, episode number nine, just 1.9. Uh, I've only seen about half of it. I wasn't impressed with that half, but I can't really give it a rating on a half. 
Yeah, I would give it a low watch it soon. Yeah, very much a character episode. I agree. Low watch it soon. Also here on Friday, we have Defiance, season three, episode number 10, when twilight dims the sky above. Haven't got to it yet, so can't rate it. I like this. I would say low watch it now. Ooh, I only went high watch it soon. Maybe I should uh, uh, re-evaluate my rating. Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Also, there we have Killjoys, season one, episode number eight, Come the Rain. Uh, Enjoyable, but nothing tremendous, so I just give it a very solid watch it soon. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't rate it. Yeah, it sounds like a topic for another tuner minute, but why do showrunners always put a self-contained little bottle episode after a really exciting episode? Um, Yeah, I agree. Watch it soon. All right, next up, our streaming show that we're covering one at a week at a time is Sense8. We're up to episode number eight of its first season. We will all be judged by the courage of our hearts. Haven't seen it yet myself. I'm not watching this yet. And to continue this uh, facade we're doing for the listeners, I've seen this entire series, but I'm pretending to watch it once a week. Uh, I'd give this this a very enjoyable episode, by the way. Very good. And when I reviewed it for my rating, I thought, oh, yeah, this is one of the good ones. Low end, watch it now. Excellent. And final show to rate would be our watch or rewatch of The Almighty Johnsons. We're up to season three, episode number eight. The asparagus is kicking in. Uh, Quite a good episode. High watch it soon for me. Uh, Yeah, I agree. Strong watch it soon. I think I rated this last year. All right, let's move over to some news items and feedback. Got a couple of feedback items first. Uh, one we'll start off on the feedback section with is going to be Matt from Australia. He's going to cover a little bit about the last ship and person of interest. I wanted to firstly thank you guys on your discussion of my feedback on the last ship. I thought what you guys said was really interesting, and I've been enjoying these last few episodes a little more than usual. I, in particular, the cat and mouse submarine episode, which I found to be quite tense and exciting for the most part. Although I do wish that at least one of those torpedoes would have hit the ship. Ah, shucks, I guess they all dismissed us, as I think one of you might have thought. Uh, But the show I actually wanted to talk about was Person of Interest, which I've started watching recently in large part due to how well you guys, and I think specifically Brent, have been talking about the show. I wanted to thank you for doing that, as 14 episodes into the first season, I've been greatly enjoying it. One thing that I remember about your conversation with the podcast about uh, Person of Interest is that there seemed to be a debate about whether or not it qualifies as a genre show in its first season. To getting about halfway in, I'm surprised this is a debate, as while the more sci-fi elements that I'm told become more prominent are not yet present, I'm guessing this AI that churns out social security numbers eventually comes either villainously self-aware or the tech is utilized by the government in some way. Uh, even the stuff I've been watching is very much my de- in my definition of genre TV, and in particular it reminds me a lot of the comic book stories about street vigilantes. You know, while Harold and Reese don't dress up in cool costumes like Oliver Queen or Matt Murdock on some of the comic book TV shows we watch, though Reese wears a suit about as much as Director Coulson, their MO is pretty similar. They take law into their own hands and help those that are corrupt or otherwise inept police force cannot. Uh, If shows like Daredevil and Arrow are genre, then this show most certainly is. Uh, The show was recommended on your podcast, and I would definitely back that up. Any fan of genre TV should really give the show a try. Uh, To me, it's genre from the very start. Uh, One of the things I've been enjoying about this show that made me think, however, was the way that the case, or perhaps social security number, of the weak formula has right now is really working for me. Uh, something that isn't always the case with the shows that I watch. Often I find myself zoning out of the X of the week plots and only perk up when scenes important to the ongoing main story occur. But so far, a person of interest, I've been engaged in these case of the week plots and found myself caring about the one-off characters in them. Uh, what makes person of interest so different in this regard? What can make one-off characters and X of the week plots work for you? Hey, thanks, Matt. Um, uh, with regard to the person of interest in our discussions, I think at the very beginning of uh, season one, just a couple of episodes in, uh, I was making comments, and I think the others were too, based on what they had heard about it. It didn't sound like it was genre. I watched a little bit of the first season and said, no, nah, it doesn't really look genre to me. Just because there's an AI doesn't really make it genre. There's got to be more to it. But as you said, by midway through the first season, I was on board with, yeah, this this looks genre to me. And then by the second season, I was like, yeah, this is a genre. So uh, no doubt. So I totally understand. Totally agree with you. To the question of, of, you know, what can make the sort of standalone or episode of the week or whatever of the week uh, shows work for me, you know, if, if it's really that kind of formula, there really isn't an overall story arc at all. It really is almost reset button-y sort of thing. It's got to be the characters and it's got to be the writing and it's got to be the acting, right? I mean, those are those are the three things. So if, if those hook me, it could be the setting as well, but it's really got to be the characters. I got to latch on to characters. I mean, if, if that's all I've got. Uh, I don't have an overall story. It's got to be characters. 
Yeah, for myself, uh, in my person of interest watch, I'm up still early in season three. Haven't had much time. Probably won't until after Dragon Con to get a little more in. But uh, as Brent said, and others have said, and kind of as you were alluding to there, Matt, it's it's got that little bit early on of what certainly could qualify it. But you get much more engaged, I think, certainly as you get a little further into it. There's some additional uh, regular characters that are now starting to make an appearance. Uh, so it it certainly makes it every episode a little fresher. Uh, they've certainly put a bigger story arc in there too. And uh, to that point about the the one offs, certainly for that show, uh, even if it hasn't felt like a certain episode has got a big you know uh, bit towards that big story, the fact they've got some strong characters in there, I find someone to latch on to. And that's you know other shows that may not be as many lead characters for that to work with. So maybe there's a bit of a freshness on person of interest to who it might be that it's going to be a little more in the forefront. But yeah, if it's those character-based shows, like Brent said, that's, you know, especially ones I love, then then I'm okay seeing just that bottle type. Yeah, it's funny that uh, you talk about bottle episodes or, you know, case of the week, because I was watching sort of the definition of case of the week, uh, rerun of Law and Order. And they did the case of the week so well that I still get sucked into watching reruns of Law and Order that are like, you know, 10 or 15 years old. And it's a combination of the characters and how they're approaching the case itself. And then a lot of times the, the guest actors that they have in or the wrinkle that they take with the, the case. Uh, often what seems to be presented at the beginning takes a big turn. Um, and I think uh, that is what makes a lot of shows where they focus more on episode of the week. The other one I was thinking of was Supernatural where Sometimes they had some outstanding standalone cases of the week, and it was usually because they reinterpreted an idea or um, we got to have some character development from the main characters that was a little bit uh, new and different. Glad to hear you're liking Person of Interest. Glad to hear you're liking The Last Ship also, because uh, for me, this season, they've definitely done some things that are more complicated with the characters, uh, especially some of the new characters that have come in. Good, good stuff. All right, we still have one more feedback for you folks, and this is going to be from uh, regular contributor Jesse Jackson. He's going to talk a little bit about the Get On With It Tuner Minute. I think a great example of a show that isn't genre but is doing wonderful things was Justified. We met Raylan, his first interaction with the quote-unquote bad guy. We established what kind of person he was, and then as the story progressed... We got more of his backstory and more of his motivation and more of his demons, all while telling a story. I think to a certain degree, The Last Ship is doing that. That as we move forward in the story, we are learning more about the characters. You know, the old cliche, show not tell. I think you can certainly add depth and character to your story elements to develop the characters and know their motivations by watching what they do and kind of working both ways. So hopefully all the big showrunners listen to this Tuner Minute and take it to heart. Well, thank you, Jesse. Appreciate the thoughts there. They, the, the last ship, now that you, when you mentioned that in here, as far as a good example there, uh, stepping back and thinking about it, and Wendy touched on the fact that what they're doing in season two, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it very much has seemed tight to me. That's, you know, someone watching a lot of episodes uh, in terms of the bits that are happening and also caring about the people they're doing. So good, good, good thoughts. Yeah, definitely. I agree about the last ship. Um, I think the showrunner, when they were at Comic-Con, said they very deliberately are trying to make every episode feel like a chapter and you want to turn the page to what's going next. And it feels like they're figuring out how to have enough plot mixed with character progress coming every week. And uh, Justified is not a genre show, but it's a very well-written show. And I totally agree that um, we know who Raylan Givens is, who was played by Timothy Oliphant, based on his actions. That tells us who he is. He does not sit around thinking about his feelings. Hey, thanks for that, Jesse. Right on, brother. Right on. I agree with you. All right, moving into some news items for the week. First one, we're going to let Wendy kick off. Probably biggest news, at least for me this week, talking about some details for Continuum Season 4. Yep, we finally have the U.S. air date for Continuum, and happily it is just one week behind 
uh, the air date in Canada. It will be coming back on Friday, September 11th, which is very exciting for its sixth season arc into the finale. There's also a link in the show notes to a proper trailer um, that just looks awesome. I remember when I saw this news, I thought to myself, you know, I bet Wendy will wait for the U.S. schedule since it's only a week later because she has a very busy schedule and doesn't really have time to go obtain the, the episodes in other ways. And I'm thinking to myself, um, I, even though it's it's only one week, I cannot resist using my Canadian contacts to get a hold of this episode as soon as it airs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being being Continuum and, and being, you know, just the last six episodes, uh, it was exciting to see that full trailer and nice to see that uh, we don't, from a fandom point of view, have to really stretch those things out too much. It'll be good timing for our podcast to be able to be uh, rating it, talking about it shortly after the U.S. airings too. So kudos to sci-fi. We like to knock them sometimes, but kudos that they didn't make us wait much longer here in the States. All right. Next up, while we're talking about return dates, Brent's got some news about Haven. Yeah. Remember, this is the final season of Haven. They they funded it. They shot it a long time ago, and then they showed half of the final season, uh, five season 5A, they're calling it. Season 5B is going to premiere on Sci-Fi in the U.S. on Thursday, October 8th. So um, just before uh, the Halloween season, we're going to be able to see the last, um, I don't know, what is it, uh, six, eight episodes of Haven? Kevin will know. Actually, I think it's even more. I mean, I think they did a double order, so I think this might be 13. I'd have to go wow. using my Google Foo to look it up. But it's no, it's a big batch of them, to be sure. Uh, now, it's great that it's not that much longer. I'm curious, though. It's going to be right in the heart of, of all our other shows on the, on the main networks coming back, too. So uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to see how well it fares ratings-wise with all the other newer shows coming back also early October. But I'm, I'm glad to see where we go. The first part of this 5A part yeah, had some good bits, but I'm, I'm really hoping it finishes strong. Yeah, it's interesting timing. Uh, your hand does have the spookiness to it, so maybe that's why they decided to wait till October. I don't know. It's interesting. I would have thought they would have brought it right back with a continuum or close to it. But I, I'm I'm happy that they're going to get a chance to finish up the story properly. But I have to admit, I'm not as excited about this show coming as I am about continuum. Oh, I agree with you there. I definitely continue higher. But uh, still, Haven you know, something I've enjoyed for several years. And I did just confirm it is 13 episodes. So we got a good chunk of story still hopefully left to play. All right, I've got our next news items, and it's very much in the Netflix world, uh, very much uh, the Marvel side of things. They, with the uh, TCA, the Television Critics Association, uh, details and uh, announcements coming out, uh, they mentioned that specifically the Marvel's Jessica Jones uh, series will be starting late in 2015. There'd been some info said it might be 2015 or 2016, They're now saying late 2015. So, you know, obviously at this point, the guess is November, December, no date given, but this is going to be a 13 episode. Uh, series. I suspect, much like Daredevil, they will all drop together. And the link in the show notes also has a video if you want to kind of take a look. If you're not familiar with this character, uh, there is a about a four-minute video entitled Comics History 101, Who is Marvel's Jessica Jones? So you can learn a little bit there on that one if you want to check that one out, folks. And also the info that came out related to this uh, link in the show notes is the fact that uh, with the other shows that they are got planning, uh, you know, Luke Cage and, and some of the other stuff and the whole Defenders series that uh, the plan is to get one, a new one of these coming out approximately every six months. So you'll get the, you know, your chunk of episodes, be able to look at it, feel bad that you watched them all so fast, likely, but know that at least in the next few months, you'll have a very similar type show probably coming down the line too. So that, that's pretty smart planning on their part, I think. I have no regrets on binge watching Daredevil, and I'm guessing I'm probably going to binge watch Jessica Jones when it goes out too. Uh, but I'm loving that they've actually been upfront about saying these are going to come every six months. I think that's a really good uh, pace to go for as for as much as they're releasing and for how much these are interconnected in terms of the universe. Yeah, I'm really glad they announced their release plans, and uh, I'm also really glad it's going to drop, and I'm probably going to watch it in a weekend just like I did with Daredevil. And uh, all i got to say is, man, is it a good time to be a Marvel fan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, for someone who doesn't have a lot of the comic background, it's still pretty damn exciting to see all this stuff coming together like this. Yeah, no, I haven't read all these comics either, but they're, it's just good storytelling, good characters. Yeah, and like I say, it was neat to see that four-minute video. I haven't watched it, but I put it aside and said, this is certainly right up my alley. Give me a little bit of background because I have no background there at all. So some smart prep work on their part. Next item for us to cover, we're going to let Wendy talk a little bit about a new show coming from Sci-Fi, Blood Drive. 
Yep, Sci-Fi is going Grindhouse. They announced at their upfronts that they're going to do a 13-episode series called Blood Drive that's set in the near-apocalyptic future, uh, which, of course, is always L.A., <laughs> and it's uh, focused on the last good cop in the city, and he has to join forces with a femme fatale who apparently needs to eat or drink people, not clear, guessing she's a vampire though, and they're going on some sort of cross-country death race uh, to save the world, and uh, it sounds pretty ambitious for sci-fi, and I would assume it's going to be possibly bonkers awesome with some crazy stuff maybe, uh, if Grindhouse is their target. I'm encouraged because the executive producers and showrunners are the folks behind um, Underworld, The Shield, Bates Motel, and Hemlock Grove. Sounds like it might be a little Mad Maxi. And uh, K- uh, Wendy, you mentioned uh, Los Angeles being the setting for a lot of this apocalypse stuff. And as somebody from Northern California, I can assure you that I already view Los Angeles as a post-apocalyptic wasteland. <laughs> <laughs> as does much of the country. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this was this was pretty cool. I mean, I I don't want to get too excited based on our first, you know, press release description, but yeah, they've thrown a whole bunch of stuff together on it. Uh and and you know, the fact that they're billing it as grindhouse style has me interested in what they kind of consider that to be. So this this has got some interesting components, got to say. I'm assuming the there will be some character with a leg made out of a machine gun. <laughs> I have to see. Okay, it's time for Brent to talk a little bit about community. Yeah, what we've got is some confirmation of something that was probably probably obvious to us, but we held out hope. Joel McHale has confirmed community is no more, uh, at least no more as a series. Uh, Yahoo did want to renew it, had interest in it, but it was just too financially uh, uh, difficult for them to do it because all of the actors' contracts were up after six years. So as I was telling these guys before the show, now we know why they were so sure that they could use the mantra six seasons in a movie because all of their contracts were up in six years, so they figured they would never be renewed. So this is our last season of the series, but we there's hope for a movie. Yeah, the business side of things kind of reminded us why certain shows have these issues getting past a certain number of uh, seasons. But again, since it fits the motif, whether or not it was brilliant planning ahead of time or just a... A nice little advertising idea that's stuck. That's uh, okay. I think I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that cherry on top of a movie. I would love it to fulfill its hashtag of six seasons in a movie. Hopefully they can come up with the dough because, uh, you know, re-signing those actors would be a very, very difficult for anything beyond a movie, I assume. But uh, I hope they can pull it off. Kickstarter, here they come. Could be. Ooh, what a good idea. Work for Veronica oh, yeah. Mars. Like Okay, next item is uh, in a link in the show notes, folks, for you that are fans of Lost Girl. Uh, Showcase in Canada put out another trailer. This is not really a mood one. This actually has some dialogue, a little more info. Uh, Certainly designed for those of you who are caught up, meaning you've seen the first half of the final season, because this is for the final eight episodes. Uh, But certainly I was a fan of seeing uh, more Kenzie in here, but uh, obviously some real uh, serious situations for our characters. So it's, it's the Good trailer in that sense that it's going to be the, oh no, what's going to happen next? Yep, it was a good proper trailer and it does happen to kind of frame out what's going to happen next. It was interesting, of course, to see light-haired Ksenia Solo as Kinsey. So uh, I wonder if she just came off the set of some other show where she had light hair. I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) Orphan Black. (laughs) Okay, moving on. Next news item. We'll let Wendy talk a little bit about uh, some details on Sense8. So uh, at the recent Netflix TCA panel, there was a panel talking about Sunset, and there's no news yet about whether the show has been renewed, but there was lots of questions about what might happen if it's renewed, and given uh, JMS's involvement, if there's a grand five-year plan, which he said, absolutely not, (laughs) there is no five-year plan, uh, but we are long game sort of people, so there, there would be a payoff. But, uh, you know, season one was all about establishing who people are and the origins. But this is not going to be sort of heavily scripted storyline like maybe some other shows that he's done. And there was also some questions about whether the Wachowskis are going to 
focus on TV? The answer was no, they're going to do whatever they want, which means movies or TV. Um, they're hopeful for renewal because there was a lot of good buzz about the show and critical reviews, um, but uh, no news yet. I find this one very interesting because um, I did watch all of Sense8 and, and it, it, it felt very much like if you, if you take, the, take it as a whole, like a very long movie with a lot of character padding early on especially, but a really satisfying ending to it. Um, not, not, you know, the end of the story, but an end of this story sort of thing where you could see a sequel. So I could see how they could continue this story and continue the adventures of our heroes. But um, even if they don't, I think this is a pretty good, you know, self-contained little series. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it. I'm very much glad with what they're talking about and what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, it's it's a show that I got through the first couple of eps, just ran out of time to watch. And when I do that, I tend not to go back to stuff. I mean, that's just my tendency. But this one I really want to make the time for. Again, hoping I might find a time window after Dragon Con and before October when a lot of our shows are back. Because I really do want to be immersed in the show and uh, looking forward to hearing whether or not it's going to get a shot at the second season. Well, one of the reasons I waited to watch the show was because I didn't hear sort of gangbuster reviews from critics. And then I heard, you know, from a lot of people whose opinion I value that, you know, it's a slow start, but it's worth getting to the end. So I do plan to watch it at some point. Uh, but I kind of view this as sort of a reading a book, and if there's another book that comes later, great, but there doesn't have to be. I'm curious about reading the book, Wendy. Do you, do you ever get to the point where, like I do with shows, where if you're reading a book and, and you're in a section of the book that's kind of boring, do you ever flip pages? Oh, skim? my God, I go right to the end. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, and it, especially if it's a series, I've already started examples where I did this. One is The Hunger Games, the Second book, I really struggled to get through. The third book, I probably read about 50 pages in, and I said, I just want to know what to these characters. <laughs> and I read the end, and I was like, I don't need to, I don't need to see the middle. And then also the Sword of Truth books that The Legend of the Seeker was based upon. That writer wrote like 12 books, and he clearly ran out of gas after the fourth one. And then he went off onto this political uh, agenda to uh he completely changed the purpose of his books in my view and it really lost me so i actually went to the internet and said what books should i read to find out what happens to the two main characters and someone very kindly said read this book read pages like x to y of this book and then read the last one <laughs> and that's exactly what i did and I've never felt that I needed to go back and read in between on either one of those. And on the next episode of the Tist Book Club, <laughs> yeah. we're going to be talking about... <laughs> I'll tell you how to, we how, some to, how to read Harry Potter, too, because there's some slow parts in that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. An interesting sidebar here, folks. We just discovered that Sense8 actually has been renewed. Uh, no details to share here at this point, but uh, I did see that come across the wire. All right, friends, got some details on a few shows that have been renewed. Yeah, we got uh, news that Scream, that um, MTV show that comes uh, after Teen Wolf, has been renewed for another season, as well as The Strain, which I believe is on the FX channel here in the U.S., has been renewed for a third season, and I'm kind of enjoying it, so it's okay. I'm glad to hear about that. Humans, which uh, Wendy and I have been crazy about, and, uh, and uh, Kevin has come <laughs> along and said, yeah, okay, it's, it's okay, uh, <laughs> has been renewed by AMC. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, 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 some interesting news here about humans. Its actual premiere episode was uh, Channel 4 in the UK's highest rated original drama in 20 years. And uh, its season one ratings have attracted 18% share of the UK viewing audience. So uh, it's a big hit in the UK. And, uh, and if you're watching it here, you understand why. It's a pretty good show. So I'm glad that that's been renewed as well. Yeah, Scream and the Strain Out ones I'm currently watching. So, you know, not much... Uh pulse movement on that but humans again while i haven't been as high as you two and several other folks it's certainly sucking me in with each passing episode so i'm very glad to know now with just a couple left that uh, we're going to be continuing that story yeah humans i'm not surprised i'm very glad that it got renewed because i don't hear as much about that show as i think it should but it might be one of those ones where season two is when everyone's going to catch on what a good show this is the Strain, I'm still not interested in watching it, but I have to admit the ads for The Strain always grab my attention. So who knows? Maybe I might try it again. Not going to try Scream, though. 
All righty. Well, I'm going to finish us up for news here in the water cooler. Uh, we've got several links for some casting details. Uh, I'm not going to give you full details on each of them, folks. I'll touch on a couple that caught my eye. Uh, and so the usual warnings, you know, apply for the next couple of minutes if you don't want to know anything about these shows. But there are some details coming up for uh, Supergirl. We also have a couple of Legends of Tomorrow casting items. Uh, the Flash, iZombie, Teen Wolf, and Sleepy Hollow as well. Now, the ones certainly maybe that caught my eye the most for shows I watch a lot, or at least from the casting side. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, a little concerned. It's not so much the casting of a new character as the fact that the headless character will not be a part of Season 3. Uh, that's a bit of a bold move. Not sure I'm happy with that. We'll have to see, I guess, what they do there. I, Zombie, which is a show I definitely fell in love with, uh, love the fact that we have uh, the great Robert Nepper coming in to play a character there. That was a nice surprise. Going to be very curious how he fits in and uh, for them there. Uh, I guess time will have to tell to see uh, there. Uh, it was nice to also see a previous genre actress coming into Supergirl there. We have uh, Jenna Dewan Tatum, who was on The Witches of East End, coming in on Supergirl. Uh, so that could be a lot of fun there. So some good stuff. Yeah, there was some good stuff. I definitely am looking forward to seeing Robert Nepper come on to iZombie as well as seeing um, the actress who was on uh, Witches of Eastwick on Supergirl. The other one, and it's not so much the actors that they cast, but the characters that are coming to Legends of Tomorrow. Um, I don't, I haven't read these comics. I'm not familiar with what these are, but uh, I like the name Vandal Savage. That is an awesome name. And it always made sense to me that there'd be a hawk man because there's a hot girl and those two seem to travel together. So that was some good news. Yeah, not a big DC fan, but I do know about uh, Hawk Girl and Hawk Man and uh, their. Um yeah, I don't know what you call it, a, a immortal epic romance thing that they're like linked together through time and multiple reincarnations or whatever. But it, I, you, yeah, Wendy's right. You knew that they had to have Aquaman at some point. So I'm, I'm pretty cool to see that. But uh, some good casting all around. And when Wendy said, which is of Eastwick, it's actually East End, just so we don't think there's movie folks coming in. Oh, but I was thinking of that TV show. <laughs> there was a, a TV yes. show also. Thank you. I never remember the names of those <laughs> witch shows other than Salem. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. Very similar. All righty. We'll finish this out here. We're going to do a two minute, as we always do. We've got one this time from Wendy entitled TMI. How far behind the scenes do you get when looking at the interwebs, the TV websites, Facebook pages of actors, Twitter feeds of showrunners? When looking at these things, how far do you want to go before you cross the threshold into too much information? And I'm not talking about spoilers. I'm talking about other information about the show beyond what's coming for the plot or casting. Have you found times where you won't look at information from a showrunner or an actor because they spill too much about how the sausage is made? I'm not talking about developing a personal dislike for an actor based on their political views or their personal views. I'm talking about information you learn about the show through those channels that maybe makes you not want to know anymore. And it doesn't necessarily mean avoiding spoilers, but even knowing that cast members are fighting with each other or a showrunner is getting divorced and is in a funk or a showrunner is starting up a movie and therefore distracted while filming the current show. Because of our podcast, I seek out information about TV shows. But I'm curious from our listeners how much you seek out information. I'm very curious at what point, because of the wide variety of information and details available today to TV watchers, how much of it folks actually read and if there's any that you actively avoid, to avoid oversharing and too much information. Okay, Wendy, now I'm nervous. Have you been looking at my browser history? Are there cameras in here you've got <laughs> watching me as I'm looking things up? Because um, I, I, I don't I don't get bothered or upset by – I do look for more information about the shows, just as you do for the, for the podcast and for just general curiosity. And, and I don't care. I mean, I, I can find almost anything about the show. And I know you didn't ask about this, but it ties into the other part of your question. I do tend to, if I if I really latch on to a character or an actor, I say, that's a really good actor or there's something odd about that actor or whatever. I do tend to like go crazy diving through links, uh, reading everything I can about the actor. Like uh, Deborah Ann Wall, I, you know, I started digging into her a long time ago. That's one example because we brought it up in the podcast where I found the links to her 
um, longtime boyfriend who's blind, and then the the you know the work she's doing on behalf of charities to help the blind and so forth. And I shared it here on the podcast and that kind of stuff. I I, I go off on tangents, uh, learning more about the people that uh, I I like the actors, um, and sometimes I'll run into things where I think, oh, that's interesting. You know, this person is married to this person who's who works on the show, like uh, Lucy Lawless. You know, uh, being married to the the one of the showrunners from Xena, sort of thing. Uh, I find things like that, and I'm like, ooh, that's interesting. I wonder how that affects the show. So in some ways, that can affect the show as well, but it never really turns me off. It never makes me want to stop. I'm just, I'm, I'm an information junkie, I guess. I just want to know more and more and more. For me, it's interesting because, uh, you know, obviously, like all three of us here, we got to keep an eye on the news, which is fine. There's certain sites and spots you get it. But as you were pointing out, when you start to drill down into social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, even Instagram is something I'm spending a little time on nowadays. I'm usually, when it comes to the people that are involved in the TV shows, if, if the information has to do with the show, and certainly in a positive light, then I might be interested. But as you said, sometimes, and nothing wrong with it, certain actors and showrunners, they have a cause they are trumpeting, or, you know, as you said, t- in there, talking about some issue related to the show, maybe. Uh, not so much complaining, but bringing up some of the complexities and stuff. To me, I'm sorry, I have limited time, and that's boring. If you're talking about that a lot, I'm probably not going to be paying attention to them on the social media side of it. I wish them the best of luck personally, but with only so much time, I'm just looking for something that might enhance my enjoyment of a show or that person's career. Uh, Not that I might not support some cause, but if it's something that they're going to be going overboard on that gets repetitive, then that's when it's to me, because I spend so much time in it, uh, that I'll, I'll ease off that person or keeping an eye on that show. And some shows even do it on their official like Facebook pages or accounts, sometimes it's very good with some info or sharing of detail or videos. And some show things, my God, they assume that you're doing nothing but watching their account 24-7 and there's so much there. It's like, okay, this is just plain overload, not even the kind of stuff I don't want to know. It's just way too much. Yeah, so the reason this came up was a couple things. One was um, information that the Sleepy Hollow showrunners were saying and I realized it's like, please stop talking because you're deflating my interest <laughs> in season three. And uh, and then also, I follow news about Game of Thrones. And there is this thing called the Kit Harrington Hair Watch in which people seem to be stalking him to find out where he is, to find out clues about what happens to his character. And I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, but then there's some other actors who... I either follow on Twitter or Facebook, and it's not directly through them, but it's through maybe things they retreat or look to, that there's some level of knowing too much personal information about people where it's like, ooh, I didn't want to know that, or I don't want to um, become that uh, that informed <laughs> about you or whatever. Um and the, the example I'm thinking of is when Nina Dobrev was exiting Vampire Diaries. And so I followed that because that was legitimate casting news. But then there were some sites that went too far into the personal details of the actor and the history on the show and stuff. And I was like, ooh, t- TMI, I don't want to know that stuff. So that was kind of where this question came from. And also, because we are reading so much news because of our podcast, I really want to hear from the listeners how much they even bother looking at any of this stuff. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how much information junkies they are like us and where that line is, because I know a lot of you do uh, share with us some of the stuff you find, too. So uh, curious to hear from you folks. Looking forward to some feedback there. Yeah, especially around actors, because like Brent mentioned Deborah Ann Wool, and like I follow Stephen Amell on Facebook and um, some other folks, Patrick Stewart, I'm a big fan of his on Twitter, and George Takei. Um, so the, I'm curious because a lot of times that leads you off into discovering really cool stuff, and then sometimes it leads you into finding really not so great things you didn't want to know. All righty. That's going to finish us up in this week's water cooler area. It's time to get ready and move over to some really detailed discussions about several episodes and certainly the spoilers related to those episodes over in our back porch. Today we talk about humans, defiance, and stitchers. All right, first up on our back porch this week, we're going to let Wendy talk about the couple recent episodes of Humans. So I'm going to focus more on the most recent one because this show is building plot-wise. And um, 
there's been a really nice payoff and evolution now between Laura and, um, you know, Anita slash Mia, because, uh, from the beginning, we always had Laura very suspicious, and now she's actually the ally of Mia. She's helping protect her and hide her um, once Leo and um, Max finally get to the house and find them. So there's been some really interesting uh, the, our main characters view since and have connections to them. We also have Niska meeting up with George and learning a little bit more about um, the history of the synths that were created after George had left working with his mentor and just some beautiful acting between um, uh, John Hurt and the Niska actor. You know, she's playing that character so interesting because it's this very damaged, you know, nine-year-old in a lot of ways. And George seems to be able to finally sort of get through to her that, you know, maybe humans aren't as horrible as she thinks. Um, we also learned a little bit more. I think we had speculated a couple of weeks ago about who was Leo, um, you know, and it turns out he's the, the, the kid in the dreams or the memories that uh, we had seen Anita having of the the car wreck under the water and saving somebody and it turns out that um, Anita isn't his his uh, his girlfriend she's more like his nanny um, or his imprinted mother and she actually had taken him out of this uh, car wreck where he had drowned and his father had resuscitated him so he's not quite human, <laughs> I guess. I think that I think there's an argument there about what is he anymore. Uh, and we also learned that the agenda of the guy who I just keep calling the lab guy, who's been pursuing these special scents, you know, he doesn't seem to want to destroy them. He seems to want to take evolution to the next step. So there's been a lot of cool twists that all sort of came to a head over these last two episodes. And then we have the, the detective and the detective synth um, hooking up, and then she comes clean and she reveals to him that she is a synth, which I was very stunned at how quickly she went there and how she might turn out to be, you know, the pursuer who is a bad guy. The husband gets a on about from his son. His son is calling him out as a perv who mistreated Anita, uh, you know, because he was truly, you know, in love with her. You know, he was he had puppy love for her and he has respect for her as a thing as an entity that the father doesn't. And so the father's on the out and he actually calls um the police on Leo and Max, so there you get pursued, and I was very surprised at um, Max's decision. He, he's running out of battery, so he can't go on uh, as they're being chased by um, the the police and and the synth lab guy, and so he falls off a bridge and seems to maybe be dead? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be really curious if he floats down the river and maybe George finds him or someone else finds him, but the show continues to have these very interesting twists and turns to the story, the decisions that the characters are making. They're very consistent, but they've taken such big turns from the people that we originally met. It's just been a really wonderful evolution for the show. Yeah, and I love that line. Uh, you know, Max's power was going out and he knew he couldn't get get away. He's going to get caught and how he's on the bridge and, and Leo tells him, you know, you're going to die. And he says, if I die, that means I lived, you know, so that to him that that's that's fine because that means he lived. Uh, and it was it was pretty sad to see him go, but kind of happy, sad. It was really weird. Um, yeah, the, 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 the transformation of of Laura was pretty interesting. And I, it felt really, it, it felt genuine when Anita woke up, you know, or Mia woke up, pardon me, from Anita, um, for real this time. And and I, I love the reaction of everybody when she just became so human, you know, human-like. 
And uh, hearing the story of of Leo uh, was really good backstory. I mean, uh, he died. He was dead. His father basically put a lot of cybernetic implants in him, captured his memories, like recorded them off of his dead brain, and put them in electronic files that he could then share. You know, when he plugged himself in and shared his video, but he's he's a cyborg, a true definition of a cyborg, I guess. Part living, part a lot of machine inside him too. So his brain is pretty much uh, a synth brain, but a human body, which is strange. Um, so yeah, really cool background. Niska continues to be a very interesting character. I really do like her. She's one of my favorites. Um, I love the the sort of at odds um, that she has with Milliken. Where you know they're they're complete opposites, but they 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 have a bond and and they can kind of see each other and talk to each other. And she doesn't want to kill him, and he doesn't want to destroy her. You know, he 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 broke off from the program because he didn't like. You know, he thought they couldn't play God, they couldn't create these these creatures like Niska. So you know, in that sense, he's he's opposed to her existence or was opposed to his ex- her existence. Uh, and she is clearly opposed to, you know, humans who are opposed to her existence essentially. Uh, so it's a very interesting relationship they have there where she doesn't want to kill him and he doesn't want to destroy her, but uh, they are not coming from a, a standpoint of being on the same page, but it looks like they're they're kind of joining forces in a way and, and may be on the same page by the end. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool as well. But oh, yeah, this, this, this show is just really good. Um, really, really good, Kevin. It's really, really good. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's got, and you both described it very well. I mean, it's just very engaging now. That's what I was kind of, I was a little, uh, I think as I've said, without trying to repeat myself, just a little bit at an arm's length with the show. But now I'm really kind of digging those things. And the the transformation of the mother, the Laura, to being the one who's actually championing some stuff is kind of cool to watch. Uh, and, and also, yeah, when, when the father, you know, quote, called the cops on them when he left, I generally wanted to hit that guy with a two by four. So I knew I was kind of caring for what's going on there. So yeah, it's rather interesting and it's fascinating watching the actors and certainly the woman doing the Mia uh, situation to be able to turn that switch to being more robotic, if you will, and then being truly human and all and off on off and so forth. So, you know, it, quite enjoyable, quite enjoyable. Uh, I'm really curious and it's, it is a little Cerebral in that sense. I'm just curious how we're going to finish out the last two episodes of this first season. It's a show, you know, there's a lot of bad things. You know, things can really take a bad turn very quickly in this show. It's There's so many things that can pivot to something positive, like they got Mia back. You know, that happened really quickly, followed by the cops are after them. Uh, you know, Max seems to be dead it, there there's a a real tension in the story as well as this these you know real emotions cuz you know it's a family that's connected and then you have these synths who think that they're a family too or view themselves as a family and now Karen Voss the detective is kind of you know she was sort of in the background but now now all of a sudden wow she might be the big bad I don't know about Big Bad, but you mentioned her as well. And I, I actually, I'm, I, it's weird. I'm not seeing her as a Big Bad. I'm actually seeing her as a good person. But maybe that's just my perception of her, um, you know, as being, you know, working for the law and so forth. But uh, I did enjoy that scene because it, it looked to me like she wasn't trying to take advantage of him, her partner. It looks like she had grown to actually care for him. And so she actually did want to be intimate with him. And then at the end... You know, afterwards, she actually wanted him to know the truth because she didn't want to keep a, a, a lie from him. Because, I mean, she was exposing herself to some serious, I mean, holy crap, uh, pile of stuff if she, uh, if, if, if he goes and tells people uh, who she is. So she was very, being very vulnerable and showing him. But before she did that, I liked the line, you know, where she, she said something like, I want you to remember that you're my favorite human or whatever she said. You're, you're the favorite, my favorite person in the world, or something. So, and she seems sincere. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think she's a bad person. I, I kind of think. I mean, yeah, she's probably working for that guy who we think is the bad guy, but he's kind of turned in this last episode too, where he saves the the, the one group of their group that they were experimenting. He didn't actually burn him, and, and it looks like he might have had good intentions, but then of course it's too late because that guy escaped, shooting some people and and fleeing. So. Um, you know, it's a complicated character there. We used to think he was just the, the stereotypical bad guy, but now we're not so sure. And, and who the cop is working for, I don't know. But I'm just, I'm not getting a big bad vibe from her. That's all I'm saying. 
uh, when I said Nisk is the big bad, I meant in relation to the synths, right? So all along we've thought that the lab guy is the big threat to the synths, but it, now it looks like she is more of a threat to them than he is. Did you mean Niska? No, not Niska. The, you the said detective. Niska. Oh, did okay. I say Niska? I meant Karen yeah. Voss. It it felt to me like she was telling him the truth, telling the detective the truth about who she was before she's going on like this suicide kill mission to take out the rest of the synths too. I'm going to be really curious if she hmm. was one of the original family that uh, something happened to her and she sort of changed her point of view that they were bad or something. It would have been interesting if they had put her in one of the memories that they showed us, if that was the case. Yeah. Uh, find it. I don't think she is. I, that's what I'm really curious about is if she's related to them, like if they think of her as another sibling, they never mentioned her, or if that's part of the problem is she wasn't ever part of the family and has always been isolated. You know, what's really funny is how could she work around... We, we noticed that all the other synths, all the ones in our group, Whenever they're near other synths, the other synths always stop and look at them and say, why don't you share? She's, that's, that's never happened to her. It couldn't have happened to her. Her cover would have been blown. So somehow she's shielded from other synths. She must be. I was wondering about that when they revealed the, that episode where she pulled the wineskin out of her stomach. I was like, how, is, how have the other synths not figured out who she is? And where does she, I guess she can charge at home so she doesn't have to go to those public stations. Yeah. More questions to be answered. Absolutely. All righty then, let's move on to the next show. We're going to let Brent talk about the two recent episodes, number nine and ten of Defiance. Yeah, I'm going to be kind of scattered brained and going around here and hitting some high points. First of all, we got the uh, ramifications of Daytac. Uh, the town believes that he sacrificed himself nobly, you know, to, to earn the uh, the pardon for his wife and, and you know, the, the honor of his family. And his wife is is shattered, and, uh, and I love the scene where she's, you know, the, the, the house servant is bathing her and says, well, at least you still have me, you know, I'm like, whoa, do you have um, actual romantic feelings for, for Stama here? Or what's going on here? Um, very interesting. But then, of course, uh, Daytac returns, at, you know, towards the end of this uh, middle or beginning of this uh, second episode, the one from this week. And uh, he's with the Votanis Collective, who tells everybody that the, the general, uh, Ramtak, uh, was rogue and he wasn't acting on their behalf and uh, they were trying to hunt him down and kill him as well and they were glad that Defiance did it. And more importantly, they're really scared of these Olmec uh, uh, people who have taken up uh, residence in, in Defiance and their ship up in the uh, in, in orbit and uh, they really want to be friends with Defiance so Defiance will introduce them to the Olmec so that they, they can all be friends and nobody will eat each other. Uh, which is pretty much what it comes down to. Um, but then at the same time, and you get this, it, it, this almost seemed artificial to me, and I, it still kind of bugs me. Um, the Nolan imagining his wartime self talking to him and egging him on and making him crazy and, and him ending up shooting uh, the apparently heroic leader of the Votanis Collective, uh, who's, who's, or at least, I don't know if she's the leader of the entire collective, but she's definitely a leader who has come to do the negotiations, and he actually goes in and kills her thinking she's holding a gun when she was holding, I think, a wine glass. That, I, I don't know. I, I don't really like that because it seemed really forced. They're trying to say that it's probably an effect of the implant in his brain since it wasn't designed for humans. Um, and, you know, the one that the, the, the Docule partially removed, she couldn't completely remove it. Um, so they're trying to use that as an excuse. And then at the end, of course, they get uh, taken into custody uh, when everything calms down and, and they're going to be taken to apparently Brazil, which is where the Votanis Collective is, is headquartered, uh, for trial. But, of course, sci-fi being sci-fi ruined that with the previews because it doesn't look like they make it there. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So I, I, I don't know that I like that development, although it doesn't look like it's going the route of a long, boring trial. So maybe I'll get over it quickly enough. And then, of course, um, you, like I said, Daytac is back and he's got a uh, an artificial arm. Uh, a mechanical a robot arm, as, as Nolan calls it, because he's able to kind of kick Nolan's butt with it. Um, but uh, he tries to get back with his wife, who's very happy to see him. But the problem is his wife had been uh, shacking up with the uh, the Olmec uh, father, and he's uh, propositioned her to come with him and be the new queen to his 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 family. And uh, and uh, she uh, and go to Australia. Apparently, they were going to set up uh, something in Australia or something like that. I don't know where they were going. Um, but uh, he, he has, she has to. To turn him down, but then also invite him to this this negotiation, which doesn't go over very well. 
uh, shows his fangs again. But also, meanwhile, the Olmec daughter is acting up again. And he has to basically put her back into suspended animation, but not before she has implanted Doc Yule with <laughs> this uh, device, which... Uh, controls Doc Yule's uh, uh, motivations, and she actually gives her a command before she's put back in suspended animation to always look out for her better interests. So as soon as I saw Doc Yule building this device, I thought, oh, okay, she's going to do something to free her from suspended animation. And sure enough, she communicates with the ship remotely and actually frees the daughter, and the daughter shows back up, not you know, much to the father's chagrin. So uh, we're getting some very interesting developments in Defiance, and, and um, I, 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 I'm still waiting for... The setup for what the showrunner said next season would be, which would be, you know, out in space, interstellar uh, defiance. I, I want to know how they're going to get there, but uh, uh, it's, it's still pretty interesting. I haven't seen the second episode there, number 10, so I can't comment on some items there. I mean, the, the parts about seeing how Stama was dealing with things now that Daytac had, to their knowledge at that point, uh, you know, sacrificed himself was, was interesting watching naturally how the townspeople and everybody else around there is going to uh, shun her for everything that's involved. So that was, you know, pretty interesting there. I'm glad from what you described that they've really got a lot of those different pieces moving in the next episode. Cause unfortunately we, I, in my mind, we're doing really good in defiance and then started to teeter a little bit and it sounds like it's bouncing back. So I'm looking forward to getting totally caught up myself. Yeah. This had some really cool turns, right? You know, we have this very, um, heroic supposed, uh, gesture by Daytag killed to save the town gets Stama cleared as well as himself from blowing up the arch and um I love the return you know his triumphant return with you know possibly an evil arm <laughs> no I'm joking but a very cool arm right he's got superpowers more than uh, humans have with arm uh and I really liked how Stama you know she's grieving She's sort of bouncing around where she doesn't really know who her allies are. She does seem to have some fondness for the Omek father, and she does seem to have um, influenced his thinking about maybe we need to make peace. These aren't just food. We're not just going to eat everybody on this planet. But that's clearly the view of the daughter. The daughter's like, we need to go back to our roots and take over this planet and eat everybody. I was... Uh, Similarly, not convinced at the change in Nolan. He went crazy way too fast to me. Um, you know, I, I get it. He's had all these failures. They had the big failure with all the people who died and then the, the grieving father who hung himself last week. But this whole thing with his war, you know, the warlike version of himself, that really felt like it wasn't earned. Um, and it really felt like it was all created it was plotted out uh, in order to set up this problem of the Votanus Collective um, leader getting killed, which seemed to be a waste because we had had so much Rom talk and it's like, seriously, the first episode, you're just going to take her out <laughs> at that point. And um, so that was, that was kind of, it felt rushed, I guess would be my ding because I'm okay with the storyline in concept. I just don't think the execution was all that tight and uh, I didn't see the preview. So I'm assuming they're on their way to Brazil uh, for whatever's going to happen uh, with his trial or something. I don't really know, but it certainly feels like Doc Ewell, who is being, I'll call it compelled by that gizmo that um, the daughter put into her neck you know, as soon as I saw her on the rooftop with, with technology, I was like, oh, she's going to free the daughter off the ship. And the daughter is a good agent of mayhem. <laughs> I'll give her that. Uh, so it, it seems like we're going on a very obvious track, though, that it's going to be the Votanus Collective and Defiance teaming up against the Omec. Maybe it'll be more interesting than that. Maybe we will see some negotiation or something happened to the father. I thought it was very well played when um, he's had this conversation with Stama about come with me to Australia. We'll teach all the Omex that, you know, they don't have to eat everyone. We can get beyond our uh, history of violence on this new planet. And once uh, Stama actually sees Daytac and goes and embraces him and 
he was just so defeated by that. So there's an interesting love triangle going on uh, there that generally I don't like love triangles because a lot of times they're forced, but this one is working for me. All righty. Good stuff there and getting close to the end of the season too. Finally, for shows to touch on this week, we're going to talk about the last couple episodes uh, for the first season of Stitchers. I'll lead us off there. These would be uh, episodes nine and 10. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who've been listening along for the last few months, uh, you know that uh, Brent and I have been watching, uh, keeping up with this show. And uh, while I would not put it near the top tier, certainly of the shows that uh, I enjoy, it's uh, it's done okay for itself. And I think it's finished really strong, uh, certainly in that last episode. Uh, over the last two, we've got the situation where, um, you know, we're waiting to see what's going to happen with uh, Kristen and, and uh, her proposal there from Liam, who came out of nowhere. Uh, and Maggie's been working hard to tell her that, hey, he did come out of nowhere. There's got to be some agenda here. Uh, it's not just an old boyfriend finally coming back from being such a great guy, uh, helping the natives, you know, in a third world country. So she does turn him down. And uh, sure enough, as we see him walking away, he we see him making a call to someone about, uh, you know, plan A didn't work. And what are we going to do next? So we got a good idea that there's some bigger play going on, which is going to be interesting there. Um uh, we'll have to wait to find out on that. We don't get any closure on that. They put some stangling, excuse me, dangling bits there for us. Uh, episode nine was also kind of fun in that we saw Linus uh, having Camille and uh, convincing Camille to really make like his uh, serious girlfriend to go have dinner with his parents, you know, because he had told her, told them about her. Uh, an episode back when they all looked like they were on the verge of death and so forth. And I thought that made for some some not only fun bits, but also the the, the chemistry between those two. I've really digging a little more as time goes on. It was, it was kind of fun to watch that. That was, you know, an enjoyable, you know, summer type show. The case of the week there in number nine, uh, was a psychic, uh, who, you know, they, uh, they had to stitch in to see what's going on. And a little bit of the, I don't know if you'd say the twist, but a little bit of that plot line is unlike many psychics. This one actually did have a gift and an ability to see things. And, uh, you know, Kristen was able to kind of sense some of that, uh, as uh, when she was stitched in. So it was, it was okay. It was good stuff. It was some enjoyable, but to me, the last episode of the season, really strong. I mean, they, they went from kind of just a show that's been kind of, uh, almost a background watch or one that you're kind of, or I feel I can kind of, uh, zone in and out of to where they really left things really strong, uh, almost a little too much. I mean, it good, but boy, did we throw a lot in this last episode here? Um, we come to find out that her temporal dysplasia, um, uh, that she's been dealing with is not something that was hereditary or anything. It was actually caused by the fact that her dad, uh, the brilliant guy who kind of came up with a lot of this actually stitched her into her mother uh, and didn't realize at the time you can't do that into a living person. That's what caused her problem and basically killed her mother. So pretty traumatic stuff there. Uh, we also had the big scene in the restaurant where there was someone uh, out to kill her or Cameron, or both, you know, someone that's we've been wondering is going on with the Stitchers program, and our uh, our cop guy who kind of came in to be the the, the muscle, uh, takes the bullets and ends up the one uh, on the verge of death there in the hospital, trying to figure out uh, Detective Fisher there. Um, but we also had Cameron pretty shot up as well uh, for a part of the episode, but he does come out of the hospital okay uh, to see what's going on. But uh, the part is really trying to find out what's going on in the bigger story. Why? Is the Stitchers program in existence? What is going on? Can we find more information? Now, actually, what happened with that shooting, they realized that at one point in what's going on there, uh, Cameron had actually walked by the car that the shooter came out of, or the person actually uh, giving instructions to the actual uh, person doing the shooting, but didn't notice the license plate, and they really want to know. So he is willing to, to take the step of actually going into a, a medical death by a drug uh, to show her how much he's committed to this and gives her just a couple of minutes that's all you know with his heart stopped to have her try to stitch in to see if she can read the license plate uh, and come back out very quickly so he's really willing to put his life on the line for this and it naturally creates quite a bit of tension and uh we can't have a good end to a first season that we know is coming back without having the fact that while she does get out in time he's flatlining as they're trying to bring him back uh, you know cue darkness now we got to wait to season two to see what's going to happen. So fun summer show that I thought did really good near the end, having some good character relationships. It is still am it's ABC Family. I'm not looking for you know lost level complexity, but kind of digging that it, it's certainly a show now. I'm a little more looking forward to coming back than I was maybe through the first half of the season. Well, that's good. I know they lost me pretty much right away, 
mostly because I had so many other shows and I just had to make a decision. So I'll be curious if uh, you guys stick around for season two and maybe I'll catch up sometime. Yeah, totally understandable on that. I mean, the only reason I stuck around really is because of Allison Scagliotti and I wanted to see what she, what she had done. But uh, um, yeah, the, the, the finale did kind of come out of the blue for me and it, it was very much a uh, background show, like you said. It reminded me a lot of like a Stargate style, style show. You know where it's it's really a story of the week, but there's a there is some there are some threads that run through the whole season. Uh, so I was watching it in the background, not really into it. But when they got to the end and they showed us more of the background and how her father was the one who created this, uh, which we didn't know, and that like you said, uh, I think her mother was in a coma or something, and then the father was trying to connect to the mother and uh, killed her, and but gave the daughter this this temporal dysplasia, and and then that might have been why he uh, left her with the, uh, the stepfather, the one who became your stepfather, who is somehow connected with the safe deposit box, <laughs> and it gets more and more deep and deep, and then we even get a flashback when she's in the memories of the one who really seems to be interested in her, the the one running the, the, the tech, running the thing, um, into his memories. She's in his memories and sees him walking into a hospital room and comforting a little girl who was her. So apparently they met when they were little, which kind of reminded me, as I said before the show, a bit of uh, fringe in that regard, because we find out that Peter and Olivia in that show had, uh, spoilers, sorry, had uh, met when they were children. So that kind of came out of the blue and kind of raised my eyebrow, and I actually started paying closer attention to the episode when that stuff started started coming out. So, yeah, it did do its job of, of intriguing me and uh, getting me interested in coming back for another season. So I'm, I'm glad it uh, got renewed. Yep, definitely a fun, certainly fits in what I call summer entertainment there. I wouldn't go putting it up against the big boys of the fall season, but, uh, you know, for an ABC family show and for a 10-episode run, it, I think it's cool. Looking forward to it next summer. Alrighty, well, that's a chock full show, folks, just covering two weeks' worth of uh, episodes and uh, news items. We appreciate you sticking around for it and hope you enjoyed it. Always look forward to your feedback, folks. Agree, disagree with us. It's always something we look forward to and enjoy getting your thoughts as well. So big thanks to Brent and Wendy. We had a blast, as always, talking about our shows and uh, still have a lot to cover uh, coming up later in the week in the last call. But we hope you all take care. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon. Catch you next time. We love to get your feedback. Call us at 206-202-4182 or leave us a Skype voicemail to our Tuning Into Sci-Fi TV name. We have many ways to keep the discussion going on our blog. Drop by TuningIntoSciFiTV.com and leave a comment. On the blog, you'll also find links to the forum discussions and other links to follow our Twitter and RSS feeds and find our Facebook account. Tuning into Sci-Fi TV was hosted by Kevin Batchelder, Wendy Hembrock, and Brent Barrett. The theme music for Tuning into Sci-Fi TV is by Beatnik Turtle. Used with permission. Listen to Tuning into Sci-Fi TV on Stitcher Radio On Demand. Download the free app today at stitcher.com. You've been listening to Tuning into Sci-Fi TV, episode 347, recorded August 8th, 2015.